dated into the 1960s. Allowing base access showed a commitment to fight communism and gratitude for U.S. military assistance. But with decolonization in the 60s and the U.S. war in Vietnam, such arguments began to lose their luster, and the number of U.S. overseas bases declined from an early 60s peak. Where access was once automatic, many countries now had increased leverage over what the U.S. had to give in exchange for basing rights. And those rights could be restricted in a variety of very important ways, including through environmental and other regulations uh, written into the SOFAs. The bargaining chips used by the U.S. were increasingly sophisticated weapons as well as rent payments for the land on which bases were established. These exchanges were often, often became linked with trade and other kinds of agreements, uh, such as access to oil and other raw materials and investment opportunities. The third period of accelerated imperial ambition began in 2000 with the election of George Bush and the ascendancy to power of a group of leaders who were committed to a more aggressive and unilateral use of U.S. power. Their ability to do so was radically precipitated and allowed by the attacks of 9-11. Uh, and, and again, they uh, were asking for a network of, of forward bases uh, for um, uh, an attempt to increase the reach of current and future forces. And uh, they focused on the need for bases in Iraq. Um, again, this is before the war as well. And that plan for expanded U.S. military presence around the world was put into action, particularly in the Middle East, the Russian perimeter, and now Africa. Okay. Um, let me go forward to um, the, the question now of whether Guam's bases, I've, I've given a history of, of the United States' overseas military bases, but the uh, question you might be asking is, why are we talking about overseas bases? Isn't Guam uh, a, a part of the United States? Doesn't it have, um, isn't it, aren't these domestic bases? Um, but, but I think it's really an, an open question whether Guam's bases are domestic or overseas bases. So again, we can ask, is Anderson Air Force Base a domestic base or a foreign base? Again, as you know, Guam's a U.S. territory, neither a fully incorporated part of the U.S. nor a free nation. The Guam license plate represents the wish of some rather than the reality, which might perhaps be better Guam U.S. sort of a. International, international legal norms make the status clear, however. Make the status clear, however. Guam is a colony and primarily a military colony in keeping with the idea that the, US, the U.S.'s imperial history around, especially in the second half of the 20th century, has been a military colonialism around the world. Guam's status shifts by context, however. The DOD's base structure report puts Guam and its 39,287 owned acres between Georgia and its uh, acres and Hawaii and its acres. No SOFA regulates the U.S. forces on Guam, and as far as I know, the Department of Defense does not need to report each day to the government of Guam on how many soldiers have been brought in or sent out, nor is it negotiating with Guam about whether and where it will grow its bases on Guam. I think one very important and empirical measure of the degree to which Guam's bases are foreign or domestic can be indexed by the quality of care that's been taken with its environment and health. Overseas bases have seen environmental devastation. Unexploded ordnance killed 21 people in Panama before the U.S. was evicted there and continues to threaten communities nearby those former bases. In Germany, industrial solvents, firefighting chemicals, and varieties of waste have ruined ecological systems near some U.S. bases. And again, I'm not, um, I'm not in making this argument, I'm not saying that there aren't other sources of toxins in our environment. Obviously, there are many more. The, the car itself is one of the primary sources of environmental damage. Uh, corporate uh, activities, corporate industrial activities are also very, very damaging. Uh, but I think it's important to note um, what these, um, again, uh, effects have been of, of the military on the environment. Uh, the South Koreans are finding extremely high levels of military toxins in bases returned to them by the U.S. from near the DMZ. Environmental standards, standards have not been high for domestic bases either, let it be said. For example, um, um, Fort Bragg uh, back in the 60s, and uh, huge fires were set to old uh, World War II barracks to, just, to get rid of them in a, in a cheap way. Um, big black clouds went out over, over Fayetteville. Uh, the water treatment plant on Fort Bragg uh, was discharging um, uh, effluent into uh, Fayetteville's waters. Um, again, it was an early 20th century uh, plant that was uh, 
that basically did very little to, to adapt the water or improve the water until uh, quite recently, um, uh, early in the 2000s. But the environment and the environmental and judicial standards that are negotiated in each country's SOFA has long been taken by activists of an index of how much respect they're accorded by the United States. Uh, those SOFAs are all quite different in terms of those standards. And if we measured the, the amount of toxins spilled onto Guam versus Germany versus the Philippines versus California versus North Carolina, we would hypothesize that we would find a racial scale, unfortunately, with the US mainland at the top, Germany next, and the Philippines and Guam at the bottom. If Guam's political status were truly domestic, we might expect Guam to look more like the mainland in terms of how the environment has been cared for. It obviously doesn't. And um, you've... Let me just refer to the, this map of the FUD sites on Guam, which shows, uh, again, how much of the island is, um, has uh, problems with, with past military activities. But the internal racial history of the United States itself demonstrates that the military base has been a bit of a booby prize for the internally colonized in the United States as well. The distinction between domestic and foreign bases has been blurry on the mainland. Uh, I think we have to say it's been blurry on the mainland too. All domestic military bases are in fact built on Native American land. And even after that land was taken, the bases were often intentionally sited on land inhabited by poor white, black, and Indian farmers. That was the case in Fort Bragg. Um, as the US uh, War Department at that time went out during World War I looking for a base uh, location area, they went to the, some of the poorest parts of the state of, of North Carolina and uh, uh, took uh, push the, uh, the those uh, farmers off the land. And there too, we can ask as we ask on Guam, who benefited then and who benefits now from base building and base buildups? What costs are externalized and borne by others? And how has a rhetoric of national security overall contributed to the notion that the military can be and should be accepted from the environmental protection standards? Okay. Let's go back. Oops. And let me also just um, briefly suggest um, again things that most of you already know uh, in part, which is you know that there are reasons why the base buildup is happening, historical reasons, uh, sociological reasons, economic reasons why the base buildup is happening on Guam right now. Uh, the first is that community protest on Okinawa, a sustained decades-long attempt to. Uh, ameliorate the effect of the bases or to get the, um, the bases to close. And again, causing the Japanese government to be willing to help pay for the movement of those bases. More generally, there's rising anti-US bases sentiment around the world in around many of the, the bases, um, in, everywhere from Italy to uh, the Czech Republic to obviously Vieques and other places, uh, there have been sustained protests and um, that has led to uh, force protection concerns by the military that have, have led them to see Guam as a more attractive place. Um, there's also uh, uh, important strategic thinking about Guam's locational advantages. And I, I say um, thinking about the locational advantages because, again, belief is very important here. Um, Guam is not uniquely located in, in any sense vis-a-vis -vis, um, some of the potential targets of US military action. Um, obviously, the Philippines would be closer to some sites um, and was the preferred site for many years as they talked about um, losing the bases in the Philippines. Strategic thinkers in the Pentagon um, were quite um, reluctant to, to imagine Guam as, as an acceptable uh, 